being able to understand a few basic physical principles about how ultrasound interacts with various human tissue as well as having a working knowledge about the key buttons used to control the ultrasound machine will maximize your ability to acquire quality images in a timely fashion. The 2D or B mode stands for brightness mode and this is simply white dots on a black background and this is the reset button on most ultrasound devices that uh, takes off any of the uh, changes you may have made or instrumentation, calipers, things like that. The brightness mode resets it back to its native state. The next button you may encounter is the M mode. The M mode stands for motion mode and the part of the spike that corresponds to the top of the tissue corresponds to this graphical representation right here of motion. This is a two-dimensional tracing of anything moving on the screen. So structures down here, like this is the plural line right here, because that's sliding back and forth, we see it represented as sandy appearance down here at the bottom of the screen. So motion appears granular, whereas structures that are static over time appear as horizontal lines when using motion mode. And then there's the color flow Doppler. Color flow Doppler is directional flow. Red is flow towards the transducer. Blue is flow away from the transducer. And as we can see here in this aortic aneurysm, there is a turbulent flow kind of going back and forth. And another type of Doppler is called power flow Doppler or color power Doppler. The way you activate that is after depressing the color button, you then activate this by the soft key that corresponds to the power flow, power Doppler uh, function. And this is an orange only type of flow. It's not directional. It's a very uh, sensitive type of flow and um, is used for um, identifying uh, perfusion in tissue that has a low perfusion state, such as the testicles. And then there's pulsed wave Doppler, sometimes called spectral Doppler. After depressing the Doppler uh, button, you get this uh, sampling gate here, and you can um, direct where you would like that sampling gate. In this case, it's over the subclavian artery, and we have, therefore, an arterial waveform. And these are called velocity waveforms, and this is uh, the, 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 the uh, peak of this spike corresponds to 20 centimeters per second, whereas over here, these are venous waveforms. This is the subclavian vein and appears uh, as a much lower flow state, maybe up to approximately 10 uh, centimeters per second. Pulse wave Doppler. Well, the way ultrasound works is uh, the transducer has the piezoelectric effect, meaning that when electricity is applied to it, the crystals shake and the sound gets emitted from the crystals at the ultrasound frequency, that those sound waves travel into the body and then reflect back to the crystals and the crystals shake again, transducing acoustical energy back into electrical energy, and the machine plots these dots on the screen. And the longer it takes the sound to come back, the further down the field that it will plot the dot. And the denser the tissue, the more echo bright the dot will be, and the less dense the tissue, such as water or urine or bile, uh, the darker the uh, dot will be, so to speak. And so. That's how, uh, in a sense, ultrasound works. It depends how deep the tissue is, how long it uh, takes the sound to come back to the probe, and how dense the tissue is, is how bright the dot will be. And that term brightness is really a better term for it is echogenic. So a structure is hyperechoic. If it is more echo bright than the surrounding tissue or more echogenic, something is hypoechoic. If it is less echogenic than the rest surrounding tissue, and finally, something is anechoic when it is completely devoid of echoes and is jet black compared to the surrounding tissue. The transducers themselves have different frequencies about which they can toggle. And generally speaking, the higher frequency transducers have better resolution but are not able to penetrate as far into the body. So for example, this high frequency linear transducer is really good for superficial structures when depth of penetration is not of concern. Whereas this lower frequency transducer here is good for penetrating deeper into the body tissues, such as when you're doing a fast exam or looking at the heart or the aorta, structures that are deeper in the body at the expense of resolution. 
so you always want to use the highest possible frequency that will get you to the depth of interest. Now you notice that each one of these transducers has a frequency range. So for example, this one goes to 5 to 10 megahertz, 3.5 to 5, 5 to 10, 1 to 5 megahertz. And basically you can toggle the frequencies up or down within each transducer depending on the clinical situation. So let's say that this transducer here goes from 1 to 5 megahertz. This is Morrison's pouch here. This is, so this is the reflection of the kidney and the liver. Here's the diaphragm over here. And um, this says gen or general mode. And so if this transducer goes from 1 to 5 megahertz, the general mode is right in between, say, 3 megahertz. Now if I come over to the soft key and depress that button now, that will toggle me up to the resolution mode. Resolution mode is the high frequency setting on any of the transducers. So for the example from the 1 to 5 megahertz transducer, this would take us up to 5 megahertz. And if you notice, the dots got a little bit more closer together or more resolute. And if I push this button again, I'm going to go to the penetration mode, which is the lower frequency setting. So in this case, it would be the 1 megahertz setting. And the dots got a little bit more uh, uh, spread out from one another. So if I go back again, here's resolution, here's general. I'm going to go now take the frequency up to the resolution mode and then down to the penetration mode. So gen, pen, res, the three frequencies about which each transducer can toggle. Now the transducers themselves have different footprints. So for example, this is the C60. It stands for con C stands for convex and 60, the number of millimeters across its surface. Notice that with any time you're working with an array, the edges of the image splay out from one another and you lose a little bit of lateral resolution. So it's important whenever working with an array transducer to try to center the structure that you're looking at down the center of the screen to take advantage of the fact that the scan lines are a little bit closer together. Now it's not so much of a problem with the C60, but when you get to the phased array transducers where all the sound comes from a single source, then the edges splay out from one another uh, a little more and you really need to focus a little bit more about getting the uh, structure you're looking at down the center of the screen. Now the advantage to this P21, 21 being the number of millimeters across its surface, short footprint probe, is that now I can get between the ribs. So in other words, I can see from the diaphragm superiorly all the way through the lower pole of the kidney inferiorly when looking at Morrison's pouch using this small footprint probe getting between the ribs. Then there's the linear probe. The linear uh, probes it's the same resolution all the way across. The scan lines are separated equally and there's no array of uh, the sound being splayed out from itself on the edges. And so you get the same resolution all the way across. And the uh, linear probe, this is the linear L38 we're looking at here and they come in all different sizes, L25s, L51s, just depending on what your specific needs are. Again, these tend to be high frequency transducers, good for structures in the near field. But each transducer has an indicator on it, no matter which transducer you're using on any kind of machine, um, you've got to try to locate the indicator because the indicator has a standard in this country. It's towards the patient's head in a sagittal view and towards the patient's right in a transverse view. So if you look at this inferior vena cava here seen in a sagittal view, this is all towards the head and over here, this is towards the feet. And that's because I've got the indicator towards the head. But if I accidentally aim the indicator down towards the feet because I wasn't paying attention, well, now this IVC is upside down. And when that IVC is upside down, while you can still interpret it, it's an upside down image and goes against the convention in the United States. And over time, that appearance uh, should uh, feel like fingernails on a chalkboard to you. So I'm going to turn it back right now because that's having that effect on me now. And this is the transverse view. We have the indicator towards the patient's right. Same blood vessel, the IVC now seen in a short axis. And we see everything over here is towards the patient's right. Everything over here is towards the patient's left. But just to reiterate this point, this is the sagittal view. And recall that sagittal means longitudinal as approached from the anterior portion of the body. And it's a long axis of the body when we come anteriorly. Transverse. It's as if we're standing below the patient's feet, looking up towards the body. I've got the indicator towards the patient's right, and the IVC appears as a short axis. And it's not unlike reading an axial CAT scan where we have everything over here to the right and everything over here towards the patient's left. Now, 
Coronal is where people can get confused. Coronal also means longitudinal like sagittal, except now we're getting a longitudinal view from the side of the body. So we've got the probe along the lateral aspect of the body, the indicators towards the patient's head, and that's why we can see the diaphragm up here superiorly, and all the way down through Morrison's pouch, we see the lower pole of the kidney inferiorly. And so this is towards the feet, this is towards the head, and this is a coronal view. It's coming from the side of the body. Now, there's the depth button, and the depth button is important uh, to adjust how deep you want the sound to uh, go into the body. And basically, the longer the sound goes into the body, the deeper the depth will be on the screen. And the way you control that is by pressing this button, the sound will go into the body less deep, and by pushing this button down here, the sound will go into the body more deep. Let me show you a clinical example. This is a patient who's got, um, this is a small patient who is a, a pediatric patient who was involved in a, a motor vehicle crash. And basically, when we look over here at Morrison's pouch, we can see that from the skin line into the body, 22 centimeters is too deep. We're wasting all the screen real estate on this small patient. So what we need to do is come over here and depress the shallower button, and that takes us to 18 centimeters. Well now, Morrison's pouch takes up a lot more space on the screen. We're not wasting so much real estate down here. We're gonna go ahead and depress that button one more time, and now we're only taking the sound down to 14 centimeters, and now Morrison's pouch appears much larger on the screen. And these are our little one centimeter hash marks that we see coming down the screen here. If you add them all up, they equal 14. So decreasing the depth maximizes the screen real estate. And then there's the gain. The gain is control of the strength of the returning echoes. And it's common for novices to want to overgain the image. Uh, so just resist that temptation, and especially in an overly uh, lit room, uh, you'll want to try to reach for this gain maybe a little bit too much. This is the top half of the gain field. This is the bottom half of the gain field. And this is the overall gain. And I'll show you how these work. So we take this image right here, and the goal is to make it uniform in its gain. So from the skin line into the body, we can see the top half of the field is overgained while the bottom half of the field is undergained. So to compensate for that, we're going to turn down the near field and turn up the far field. And as we do, now we have the opposite problem. The far field is overgained, the top field is undergained. So to compensate for that and make it uniform, I'm just only going to now turn down my far field. And as I do so, well, now the whole screen is uniform, but the entire thing is uniformly undergained. So what I'm going to need to do is uniformly increase that amount of gain. And as I do, now I went a little too far. You see the whole field is overgained, and you're starting to lose information here where I'm looking for anechoic fluid in Morrison's pouch between the liver and the kidney. Well, now I've overgained it, so I can't tell if there's fluid there. So I'm going to go ahead and turn down my overall gain just so my gain is perfect. And now I've got uniform gain top to bottom. So is this image now perfect or is there one more thing we could do to adjust this image to make it more perfect? And the depth is at 18. If we took the depth to 14, this indeed would be a perfect image. It's a small patient, so we're on the resolution mode. We've got our gain adjusted perfectly. And if we just turn that depth down one, less notch to 14, the image would be optimized for that particular window. Well, then there's different artifacts. The word attenuation means the progressive weakening of the sound as it travels into and then out of the body. When sound encounters a high attenuating tissue, therefore, the echoes posterior to it get diminished and an acoustic shadow is what results. This happens when you have tissue that is very high density, such as gallstones. You see the sound is getting attenuated or weakened as it encounters the gallstones and then there's a shadow that persists and that is what defines us as having a gallstone. Sometimes sound can travel through an organ very easily such as fluid or water or the urinary bladder. See when sound encounters this low attenuating tissue well then the echoes behind it get enhanced posteriorly and that's the reason why we use the bladder as an acoustic window to visualize structures behind it. See, in this example here, we can see 
the anechoic bladder is as appears uh, basically black on the screen and structures behind it have posterior acoustic enhancement because of the low attenuating effect of the bladder structures posterior to it are echo bright then there's gas gas is the true enemy of ultrasound when sound encounters gas it gets scattered everywhere and you lose the the uh, ability to really process the image and make any meaningful interpretation of it so when you look at an image like this and you can't make any sense out of it the answer usually is bow gas happens a lot with you're scanning the aorta and the solution is just to push the probe um, with more force to displace some of those loops of bow to get around the bow gas refraction is another type of artifact when the sound is going through two different mediums uh, it gets redirected or refracted and then what happens is you have um, a shadow that exists down the edges of that second medium this is not unlike the bending of a pencil in a glass of water as seen with Snell's law and so we have medium one medium two the sound changes speed and as it does so it gets redirected or refracted and we get these lateral shadows that come down on the edges of the different medium reverberation artifact appears as equidistant arcs from the transducer when you see these equidistant reverberation artifacts it uh, we see that a lot on transducers and you don't want to mistake that for something um, anatomic or pathologic so this is an ovarian cystic structure here seen with the intracavitary transducer and we see these equidistant arcs coming down right here and that's uh, not a hemorrhagic cyst or anything clinical that's simply reverberation artifact we see it anytime we use a curved or a phased array transducer very commonly we see these reverberation artifacts and finally there's the mirror image artifact and the mirror image artifact is very helpful in diagnosing um, hemothorax uh, pleural effusion or ruling out any fluid in the chest so when you have the mirror image artifact that means there's no fluid in the chest here's how it works when the sound uh, goes through the liver in Morrison's pouch so this is the kidney this is the liver this is Morrison's pouch here in that right upper quadrant view as sound goes through the liver it encounters the diaphragm in the normal chest it is unable to get across the diaphragm but instead rolls along the edge of the diaphragm and then finally makes its way back to the probe and the machine misinterprets that information as there being uh, further tissue afield and it does so because it took the sound longer to get back to the probe and therefore it thinks there's something further down on the screen and the material that it plots further down on the screen is the material that the sound was running through which was liver and so when you get the mirror image of the liver up in the chest or on the left side of the body the spleen up in the chest that's called the mirror image artifact and it's an expected artifact in all normal individuals we can see it here this is the liver here's our diaphragm here and superior to the diaphragm uh, we see the uh, liver up here superiorly remember this is a coronal plane so structures over here are more towards the head or more superior so to conclude when you're trying to obtain the best possible image you really need to know your anatomy knowing your anatomy will help you know what to expect when you're visualizing it in two different planes rotating from a sagittal to a transverse or from a coronal to a transverse knowing your anatomy will help you expect what to see on the ultrasound monitor as well as to define the boundaries of an organ knowing that the along that posterior wall of the gallbladder will be the second portion of the duodenum will help you make sense of whether or not you're looking at a gallstone or air as an artifact so knowing your anatomy again helps to define these boundaries you need to choose the proper transducer and that's based on both the transducer shape or its footprint as well as its frequency bandwidth knowing that higher frequencies are good for more superficial structures because we could take advantage of that high frequency resolution principle and learning where to put the transducer on the body surface the acoustic windows that's something that you're going to perfect as you go through and learn each module of ultrasound and don't forget to maximize your system controls and those controls are the depth the gain and the frequency